Thank you very much for inviting me to speak to you today. It's a great privilege. I'm sorry that I can't be with you in person, but we, we will just have to do with this remote link. I was due to do one presentation to you, but I've now got the chance to do two presentations because my colleague Fred is sadly unwell. So you're going to have to put up with me for twice as long as you might otherwise have had to. I'm going to speak on two topics, and they're two related topics. The first is whether banking secrecy is a fact or fiction. And I'm going to talk about that in particular in relation to the international finance centres or the British international finance centres or what you will refer to them as offshore centres or fiscal paradise. And I'm going to discuss with you what banking secrecy means there. And I'm going to discuss that first with respect to criminal process and criminal procedure. And I appreciate that a lot of you will be extremely experienced in the criminal process and in conducting criminal investigations and criminal prosecutions. And I hope that what I have to say about information which can be obtained outside of Brazil from the offshore islands is helpful to you. And I'm then going to talk about why the use of civil process and private lawyers can be extremely helpful in asset recovery cases. I have the great benefit of having worked as a prosecutor for a number of years and to have prosecuted many cases involving serious or complex fraud and very complicated money laundering. And I also have over 20 years of experience in private practice dealing with fraud cases using civil procedure and using the tools which are available to private lawyers. Let's start with banking secrecy. Does banking secrecy exist? Is it fact or fiction? And like lots of things that involve lawyers, it really depends what you mean by banking secrecy. The offshore centres get very upset when they are accused of being secrecy jurisdictions because secrecy is a word which is used to mean something dishonest and to mean a jurisdictions which will hide information and refuse to cooperate. And many offshore jurisdictions are right to be upset when the word secrecy is used about them in that way because their laws about disclosure of banking information are in the main part exactly the same as those in England and Wales and pretty much the same as anywhere in the common law world. So in the common law world, a person is entitled to have their financial affairs kept private. They are 
entitled to confidentiality. People shouldn't know their banking information. These are basic principles in the common law and also in much of the civil law world as well. So what does confidentiality mean? When can it be lifted? It has long been the case in most of the common law that if there's been a crime, there can be no confidentiality. There can be no secrecy. And by court order, any confidentiality can be removed, any secrecy can be removed. And I'm going to talk uh, about a case and use a case example. And I know that it's a case which will be very familiar to many of you, um, either through the press in Brazil or because you were involved in this case. And can we go to the first slide, please? The, the chart, please. This looks a pretty complicated chart, but it's the simplified version of a very, very sophisticated money laundering system used by the former mayor of Sao Paulo, Paulo Maluf. If you look at the left of the chart, you'll see in the top box, top left hand corner, Emerb. And Emerb is a or was a public company in Sao Paulo owned by the municipality. It paid money for infrastructure projects. In the case I looked at, the building of a, a motorway, a freeway, and it paid money to a very well known company called Mendez Jr. Mendez Jr. raised invoices for the work that it claimed to have carried out. But in fact, though it did carry out some work, the invoices that it sent to Emerb were grossly inflated, up to 90% of the contract price due. Mendez Jr paid money to subcontractors. Many of those subcontractors did no work whatsoever, but they were paid large sums by Mendez Jr. And this was just a means of stealing money from the taxpayer of Sao Paulo. The proceeds of that crime in Brazil were paid to uh, unlicensed dollar de dealers, Dolieros, You'll see those in a box in the middle of the chart. And from there, sums were credited to a coded bank account in New York. You see New York in the middle of the top um, into a coded bank account called Chinani at Safra Bank in New York. And from there, funds were transferred across the Atlantic to Jersey, where I live, and they were deposited into bank accounts held by two British Virgin Island companies called Durant and Kildare. From there, they were paid, the money was paid into a series of funds. Do you see them at the bottom right hand corner of the chart called Oryx? Latin America Infrastructure Fund, Mercosian Challenge, Latinvest, Brazilian Value Fund, Foundland Investments. Those are very unusual investment funds because they only had one investor in truth, which was Mr. Malouf. And then do you see the line going all the way along the bottom of the chart, back towards the left-hand side to Yucatex, You'll all know Yucatex, I imagine that's a publicly traded company in Brazil where the Maluf family 
are major shareholders and that the funds in Jersey were used to disguise Maloof's investment into his own company. So how does banking secrecy apply to this? Well, there's confidential relationships all over this. If you go to New York, the owner of the coded bank account, Chinani, the account at Safra Bank, has an expectation of confidentiality, secrecy from Safra Bank. And then if you come across to Jersey, the bottom right hand side, the British Virgin Island companies, Durant and Kildare, have an expectation of secrecy from the banks in Jersey, in the offshore centre, and the trust companies. So how did this secrecy all unravel? How was it, was it broken? Well, in Brazil, on the left-hand side of the structure, there was a criminal investigation by the Brazilian authorities, and lots of information and evidence was gathered about Mendes Jr. and the subcontractors. And people who were witnesses gave evidence about the fraud that was being committed inside the offices of Mendes Jr. The banking information and the Brazilian banking information was obtained, obtained from EBERB so that transfers to Mendes Jr. could be seen. So Brazil gathered evidence in Brazil and got it into a form which showed that there was a crime being committed or strongly a strong suspicion that crime was being committed. Over in Jersey, all the way across the Atlantic, it's old Jersey, remember, not the new one in America, it's Jersey, the offshore center near France. There was an investigation there and there was a suspicious activity report made in Jersey to the Jersey police. And so information was gained in the offshore center that there might be a crime being committed in Brazil and also that there might be a crime being committed in Jersey, the crime of money laundering. The Jersey um, police collect the suspicious activity reports from the Jersey banks and financial institutions. They are members of a group of force intelligence units called Egmont. And again, I'm sure all of you will know this. Egmont is the place where the first meeting met of the first meeting happened of police officers responsible for dealing with intelligence which came from financial institutions and other places in their jurisdictions. So the Jersey police informed the police of the information they'd received. I can tell you this because that's all public, it's all been reported in, in, in many different places. But it's a really good and simple example of how secrecy or confidentiality can be broken and information as to crime can be shared. So offshore centres do, don't think that if money goes outside of your jurisdiction that you can't trace it and that you can't get information because you can and this is a very good and simple example of how that happened so let's also examine what else happened in order to lift banking secrecy in this case starting first with Brazil's dealings with the Jersey authorities. 
Brazil knew that there was information they needed in Jersey because the Jersey police had told the Brazilian law enforcement authorities that there was information. And so the Brazilian law enforcement authorities put together what we'd now call an MLAT, so a mutual legal assistance treaty request, what, what was then called letters of request, and a request for the obtaining of evidence was sent from the Brazilian authorities to the Jersey authorities. To the best of my recollection, it went directly to the Attorney General of Jersey, because as a matter of Jersey law, that's perfectly permissible. And the Brazilian law enforcement authorities asked for evidence about all of these funds which were in Jersey, about any assets which Mr. Malouf might hold through Jersey. And the Jersey authorities sent all of that information to Brazil. There was a fight about it because Mr. Malouf was and is a very sophisticated man. He could pay for expensive lawyers. And there were legal challenges in Jersey brought on behalf of Mr. Malouf, though not in his name, for disclosure of the letter of request that Brazil had sent to Jersey to him. He lost that. There was an, then an application for material not to be transmitted from Jersey to Brazil, him alleging that it was a, effectively a political, political case. He failed in that. And all of the material was sent from Jersey to Brazil. Let's, let's then look at the New York aspect. You see New York in the middle because there's at least three jurisdictions. In fact, there's four jurisdictions involved because BVI, British Virgin Islands, was involved as well. But the Jersey law enforcement authorities, they knew that there was information that they needed from New York because they could see on bank accounts from Jersey banks that there were payments made from Safra Bank in New York, which carried a code word, Chinani. You see the top under New York, Chinani there? And so the Jersey authorities asked the American authorities for help to find out what Chinani was and who owned it. And so the Americans, the United States, shared that information with Jersey, and Jersey shared their information and evidence with the United States. And as I anticipate many of you will know, the New York authorities began criminal proceedings against Mr. Malouf and his son Flavio in New York. They issued, they, they invited Interpol to issue a red notice for Mr. Malouf and his son Flavio, and they sought to try him in New York. Also, as you will all know, there is no extradition treaty. I believe that's still the case between the United States and Brazil. And so what did Mr. Malouf do? Well, he had to stay in Brazil. And his days of traveling to Switzerland and Monte Carlo and London were finished. And again, you, you know what happened in, in Brazil. He was prosecuted successfully in Brazil. So in my eyes, this is a really good example of how 
offshore secrecy, as many people would call it, can be breached where there's suspicion of crime. The offshore banks and financial institutions have an obligation to disclose information to the Jersey police where, where they suspect they hold the proceeds of crime. And the Jersey police have the power to disclose that information to their colleagues in Brazil. And they have their they have the power to disclose the information to their colleagues all over the world, and they will be doing that every day. So I hope I hope I hope that's a good example of how the criminal system works. In those days, Jersey, the island where I live, did not have non-conviction forfeiture laws. It does now. And pretty much the same system works for non-conviction based forfeiture as it does in a pure criminal case. And it may be that if this case was to happen again or something similar, that it would be non-conviction forfeiture methods which were used to recover at least some of the assets which were held through Jersey because the Jersey law allows the forfeiture of funds held in bank accounts where it's shown that they are the proceeds of crime. And in this case, that would have been fairly straightforward. So, criminal process worked well in this, if very slowly. There was a prosecution in um, Brazil. There was a an indictment laid in New York. So charges, criminal charges were brought in New York. But the criminal process did not bring a single penny, a single cent back to Brazil. It was civil process that was used to do that. And I want to move on, if I may, to the second part of my talk, which is when civil process may be better when it may be better to instruct private lawyers in cases like this where there's been fraud. And if we can go to my next slide, please. So can, can we can we go? That's fine. That's my first slide. Great. Thank you. So what are the main benefits of using civil recovery. So by that I mean using the system of law which is available to every citizen, every private citizen, company, municipality, state to um, sue people, to issue civil proceedings seeking damages or restitution of assets taken from them. What are the main benefits? Well, the standard of proof is much lower in civil proceedings, as you all know. One has to prove a case on the balance of probabilities or the preponderance of the evidence, as the United States put it. Nobody's going to jail, so it's a lower burden of proof. And there are less strict rules of evidence when the case is about property, not the loss of an individual's liberty. So let, let me give an example. In Mr. Malouf's case, in the, uh, in the end, none of the 
key witnesses would attend to give evidence. So the employees of Mendez Jr. said they wouldn't come. They said they wouldn't even attend a TV station in Brazil for their evidence to be given by LiveLink. Why? Well, they were admitting really serious criminality. They were criminals. They didn't want to come. But because it was a civil case, or particularly because it was a civil case, in the end, that didn't matter. Their statements were read to the court. They were just read out. And when they were added to the documentary evidence, which was overwhelming, the case was proved. While we only ha had to prove the case on the balance of probabilities, the Jersey court found that there had been criminality beyond reasonable doubt. So it decided the case, it decided that we'd proved it on the criminal standard, even though we only had to decide it on the balance of probabilities. So standard of proof is a hugely important aspect of bringing civil proceedings. Can I have the next slide, please? Also, it's extremely important to note that in civil cases, you can bring cases against persons where it would be impossible and actually quite wrong to try to bring a criminal case. So that might be an auditor who's negligently carried out an audit or a bank that's been negligent in acting on payment instructions, or it might be against a director for breach of fiduciary duty. In the common law, you can bring claims which are called proprietary claims where you say, that is my property now. So if money is taken out of a bank account, which was yours and put into a thief's bank account, it may well be you can say that's still my property, property, and that's a very potentially very strong case. And you might remember on the chart that we looked at to be to begin with, there were two British Virgin Island companies called Durant and Kildare. Can we just go back to the chart for a moment, please? So if you look at the if you look at the right hand side of that chart, do you see Durant International Corporation and Kildare Finance Limited? And it says BVI, which is, as you all know, British Virgin Islands, an offshore center, and then Jersey below. The claim that we brought for the municipality of Sao Paulo was not against Paulo Maluf personally. It was brought against two British Virgin Island companies, Durant and Kildare, on the basis that they had dishonestly assisted in the fraud. So they had been, we said they'd been complicit in the fraud. And the benefit of that was that those companies held bank accounts in Jersey in their names and also held shares in all of those underlying companies. So there was assets in Jersey and elsewhere, which we could enforce against after obtaining judgment against Durant and Kildare. And while it might have been theoretically possible to bring criminal proceedings against Durant and Kildare, what would the point have been when civil proceedings could have been, were, could, could be brought and were brought and where the standard of proof was so much lower and where the process was much quicker. So can we move back through the slides, please? And go on to the next slide, please. So 
what other benefits are there of instructing private lawyers? I mean, I'm obviously going to talk about the, the common law, which is what I know about. Or I'm going to do that in the main in the main part. The common law has very good, generally has very good laws allowing for third party disclosures orders to be made where there's some evidence of wrongdoing. So in in Jersey and Cayman, in the British Virgin Islands, Guernsey, the Isle of Man, in the right circumstances where you've got some evidence of fraud and you've got some evidence that a third party has been caught up in the wrongdoing of others, you can go to court and get an order that that third party disclose information. And you can get that against banks, trust and company service providers, auditors, financial consultants, lawyers, actually anybody that's caught up in wrongdoing. So you could even get an order, for instance, against a hotel that might provide safety deposit box services. And relating this back to the Malouf case and the structure chart, we, on behalf of Sao Paulo, obtained disclosure orders against the Jersey trust and corporate service provider that had created the structure that held the assets. And there was a there was a fight about it, of course there was, but the court ordered that disclosure be made. And it was ultimately agreed that the trust company would disclose to the municipality of Sao Paulo everything that had been disclosed to the Attorney General of Jersey. So that speeded up the application. So that this is an extremely powerful tool. And it's right to say that for the offshore centers that I've mentioned, once you can show some evidence of fraud, the courts do not want to be thought of as places that help fraudsters. They want to be thought of as the opposite of that. And there's many statements of principle to that effect amongst the international finance centers, the offshore centers, as you will refer to them as. Next slide, please. So also available to private lawyers are freezing orders. And where there's a good arguable case and where you can show a risk of dissipation of assets, which will really frequently be the case um, in fraud cases, because you can show that you're dealing with dishonest people. You can have assets frozen pending trial. And those freezing orders will almost always be coupled with disclosure orders, which order financial institutions and also the main target, any main target of the injunctions to disclose evidence of what assets they hold and where the free those freezing orders would will, will often be obtained ex parte without notice to the defendant and they will bind banks and financial institutions which ha which hold have relevant information The person who is the subject of the freezing order 
the defendant obviously has the right to come back and apply to have the freezing order set aside, but that can be very difficult if the application is made properly. It's also possible to have secrecy or gagging orders, and those can be extremely important when you're seeking third party disclosure orders. So often we'll be instructed to enforce a judgment in another from another jurisdiction, and there'll be evidence that there might be assets held, for instance, in a Jersey bank account. You would get a disclosure order with an order from the court that they, the bank must not inform its client of the disclosure of the fact that you have a disclosure order for a period. So often in Jersey, it would be a period of, of seven days. That would give you the opportunity to see if the disclosure order revealed assets in another jurisdiction and to take steps to freeze it before the account holder finds out what's happening. That can be a, an extremely effective remedy. I can see from my stopwatch that I've got about three and a half minutes to go and I'll, I will finish in time. Um, in, extreme search, in extreme circumstances, you can obtain a search order in civil proceedings. So you, you can have a hotel ordered to open a safety deposit box, or you can even have a private home searched um, if you've got really strong evidence to suggest that evidence will be destroyed if you don't get it. And another very important tool in the, in the common law world, contempt of court orders. So if people disobey court orders, they can be sent to jail. Now, obviously, if a person isn't within the offshore island, they're not going to be, it's not going to be effective to send them to jail. They're not going to come to jail voluntarily. But there are other orders the court can make, such as striking out defences because someone hasn't complied with court orders. And we very recently just completed a case where the defence, the answer of the defendant was struck out because they disobeyed court orders. And I wanted to, I wanted just to make this point before I move on to my last slide, which I'll do with very quickly. There's no right to silence in a civil case. You have to answer the allegations. And so if you can if you can plead your case, if you can set out the case as to why you've been the victim of fraud or of a wrongdoing or of a crime, then the defendant has to explain himself. And if he doesn't explain himself, then he's likely to lose. And the court will take against him and draw inferences against him. So the fact that there's no right to silence um, or should I, I put it this way, you have to plead and if you claim that you don't want to answer because you put yourself at risk of criminal prosecution, you're going to lose. Can we move on to my last slide briefly, please? And that, that that's insolvency, and I, I know that Brazil um, and Brazilians use insolvency tools very frequently and very successfully, but insolvency is a great tool. If you can get a judgment against a person or a company, or, or, or in relation to companies, sometimes where you can get a company wound up on just and equitable grounds, which, which in essence means that you can show that there's no proper purpose for the company so that it, it's just being used to launder money. You can have a liquidator 
appointed appointed and the liquidator has powers to step into the shoes of the company or the person to accept claims from those that have lost to chase assets and to hold people involved with the company such as former directors liable for the debts of the company for breach of fiduciary duty they also have the power to sue outsiders such as lawyers accountants or banks who might have been complicit in the losses suffered by the company and there are very wide powers of international cooperation where insolvency practitioners can be recognized in overseas jurisdictions so i think that i've just about stuck to my promise to speak for 40 minutes i think there's a final slide um, but i'm happy to take any questions anybody may have